For decades, African nations have expressed concern about foreign troops, military bases, and drones exploiting their resources, but their claims have often been met with skepticism. Doubts arose as a result of the involvement of prestigious entities, such as the United Nations and Western nations, making such allegations difficult to believe. However, recent events in the Democratic Republic of the Congo have raised these concerns. A drone was discovered attempting to take off from Congolese territory, prompting immediate scrutiny. The discovery of this drone's presence, despite the fact that it is unmanned and typically controlled from remote military bases, has highlighted the possibility of covert operations. Aside from aerial surveillance, these drones have concealed spaces capable of carrying weaponry and other unspecified cargo. The interception of the drone by the villagers resulted in a thorough examination of its contents, shedding light on the covert possibilities and raising questions about the true intentions behind these airborne operations. This incident provides concrete evidence that long-standing concerns about the exploitation of African resources through covert means have been validated, lending credibility to claims that were previously dismissed. They allegedly discovered guns, parachutes, and gold, as well as one precious element, which you will learn about in this video. Even if UN troops remain as peacekeepers, they have engaged in such exploitation. This demonstrates that they have been stealing resources from the beginning. So, what else was inside the UN drum, and what did Congo do about it? Let's find out more in this video. There had previously been reports of UN peacekeeping missions engaging in illegal activities in Africa. It was revealed that UN peacekeepers provided armed escorts to gold smugglers. They supplied food to illegal gold smugglers in eastern Congo, according to a UN report later revealed by Reuters. According to the report, UN peacekeepers did not directly participate in the exchange of weapons for gold. However, it was an unofficial admission that they were indeed involved. Human rights organizations later accused UN peacekeepers of trafficking arms in exchange for gold with a militia. In late 2005, they were tasked with disarming while stationed in the eastern mining town of Mongvalu. The internal UN report based on the investigations confirmed that the peacekeepers facilitated the group's transportation, meals, and security during their visits to Mongolu in November and December 2005. During these visits, the smugglers obtained significant amounts of unwrought gold without the permission of the government. The report did not specify how much compensation the UN peacekeepers received for their assistance. When the allegations first surfaced, the UN dismissed them as malicious and distorted, but it did acknowledge an ongoing investigation. Human Rights Watch, the New York-based organization that first raised the allegations, blasted the report for failing to thoroughly investigate the collaboration, despite highlighting the involvement of senior Congolese army officers. HRW Congo researcher Anna Cavan Vudenberg described the situation as a mafia-like organization profiting collectively. The report made no mention of a letter circulated by two former members of the Nationalist Integrationist Front, a militia responsible for the murders of nine UN peacekeepers in 2005. According to the letter, they worked for the UN peacekeepers, exchanging gold for arms and ammunition to secure the town of Mangbalu. The findings have harmed the reputation of the UN's 17,000-member peacekeeping mission, which was critical in guiding the Central African nation through landmark elections following the 1998-2003 war, but has been plagued by scandals. Later, the mission announced an investigation into separate claims that UN peacekeepers exchanged food and military intelligence for gold with Rwandan Haudu rebels. Historically, it has been the responsibility of troop-contributing nations to punish peacekeepers who have engaged in misconduct, with severe penalties being rare. In early 2005, a military court in Bangladesh convicted three of the country's UN soldiers of using excessive force, which resulted in the deaths of two Congolese detainees and the beating of several others. Two soldiers were sentenced to 89 days in prison, while a third was sentenced to 60 days. Human Rights Watch later wrote to the UN, requesting a thorough investigation. While acknowledging the importance of investigating these allegations, Human Rights Watch was disappointed by the report's apparent limitations, the lack of transparency throughout the process, the sluggish pace of the investigation, and, most importantly, the lack of concrete accountability measures. 
According to Human Rights Watch, the reported involvement of only one peacekeeper in illegal activities contradicts earlier information provided in 2005. Its findings revealed a network of Congolese army officers, Kenyan traders, and UN peacekeepers smuggling millions of dollars worth of gold from Atori. The report's conclusion that only one peacekeeper was implicated surprised many people. The UN investigation was also said to have dismissed allegations of weapons trading between UN peacekeepers and the Nationalist and Integrationist Front Militia in Achuri. Senior FNNI commanders, however, confirmed receiving weapons and ammunition from UN peacekeepers in 2005. The gravity of the alleged UN peacekeeper abuses in a region where war crimes against humanity have occurred cannot be overstated. UN peacekeepers' involvement in gold trading and the potential provision of arms to militia groups directly contribute to the violence they are supposed to prevent. The lengthy investigation process and lack of action raise concerns about how the UN investigates itself, especially in light of allegations involving Indian and Bangladeshi peacekeepers, as well as reports of sexual exploitation. Human Rights Watch later stated that, in addition to improving accountability in the DRC mission, the UN should overhaul its internal oversight system. An investigation alone was insufficient. The UN must have acted on the findings of its investigations to prevent such problems from recurring. However, one thing should be mentioned. What if UN peacekeeping missions did the same thing in Europe? Would they have remained hidden, rendering the investigation absurd? It sent a clear message that UN troops were not stealing and smuggling gold or supplying guns to militias in exchange for gold in their personal capacity. Rather, the United Nations was involved. It becomes impossible for UN troops to act on their own initiative, particularly in African countries where their activities are monitored. BBC programs highlighted the UN's internal oversight arms incomplete investigation into UN peacekeepers allegedly involved in gold and weapon smuggling in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. The allegations leveled against certain UN peacekeepers in Congo were serious, but they went unanswered, harming the UN's reputation. According to Human Rights Watch and BBC Investigations, substantial allegations of illegal behavior by UN peacekeepers in Congo have been ignored, downplayed, or set aside, with little accountability for acknowledged crimes. Human Rights Watch requested a meeting with Inga Britt Alenius, Under Secretary General for OIOs, in September 2007 to discuss concerns, but the request was denied. As a result, Human Rights Watch applauded the UN's dedication to transparency and accountability. OIOs ignored new evidence that confirmed weapons charges. Authorities in Pakistan claim exoneration, but OIOs discovered one officer involved in illegal gold trading and others obstructing the investigation. Allegations against Indian peacekeepers in North Kivu, Congo, raise similar concerns. An OIOS assessment from February 2008 lists 44 allegations and recommends further investigation. However, OIOS pursued only one allegation at a senior level, condensing the preliminary report to a four-page memo. The memo acknowledged evidence of gold purchase and unlawful detention, but dismissed other serious charges, raising concerns about the investigation's thoroughness. External reviews conducted in 2007 identified structural issues within OIOS, indicating the need for significant change. The toxic management environment and lack of accountability endanger the DRC mission and peacekeepers around the world. That is when you should be aware of the UN peacekeeping missions in Congo in order to comprehend how much the country could have been exploited up to this point. In response to the Congo crisis, the United Nations launched the ONAC operation in the Congo in 1960, marking the UN's first foray into peacekeeping with significant military capabilities, establishing it as one of the most significant and expansive UN missions. However, it was one of the most profitable UN missions in secret, as tons of gold were stolen from Congo. As previous incidents demonstrated that exploitation by UN missions is never properly recorded and investigated, it opens the door to thousands of possibilities for what the UN missions would have done in Congo. Internal conditions in Congo may have been created to pave the way for a UN peacekeeping mission.
In reality, the UN gold smuggling mission was intent on engaging in any shady activity in order to steal and smuggle gold. The Congo descended into chaos after gaining independence from Belgium in June 1960, prompting Belgium to intervene ostensibly to restore order and protect Belgian nationals. On July 14, 1960, in response to the Congolese government's request for assistance, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 143, urging Belgium to withdraw its troops and empowering the Secretary General to provide military assistance to the Congolese government. The first UN troops, primarily from African and Asian countries, were deployed the following day. With issues like the Uprishing in Katanga, the assassination of Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba, the collapse of the central government, and the involvement of foreign mercenaries, ONUC's initial mandate grew. It was expanded to include preserving the Congo's territorial integrity and political independence, averting civil war, and removing all unauthorized foreign armed forces. The world witnessed something it had never seen before. The UN had direct control over a country, both internally and externally. At their peak, UN forces included nearly 20,000 military personnel from more than a dozen countries, with India, Ireland, and Sweden playing prominent leadership roles. Between September 1961 and December 1962, as hostilities escalated, ONAC transitioned from a peacekeeping to a military force, fighting and offensives against secessionist and mercenary forces. Following Katanga's reintegration in February 1963, ONUC gradually phased out, with increased civilian aid becoming the most extensive UN assistance effort. Today, there is a growing debate about why the conflict in Congo began immediately after its independence. Whether they were natural or foreign forces, they all contributed to the need for UN peacekeeping missions in Congo. Please like and share the video, and subscribe to our channel to see more videos about black culture. History, civilization, and identity are all intertwined. Let us now proceed. Congo gained independence on June 30, 1960, but disorder and mutiny ensued as a result of Belgian commander Emile Janssen's belated Africanization of the forced public. Belgium's intervention prompted the Congolese government to accuse Belgium of neocolonial aggression, with Belgian officers accused of inciting the mutiny and attempting to annex the Congo. Belgium's intervention, aimed at protecting Belgians and mining interests, resulted in Katanga, a mineral-rich region, seceding. Without a request from the Congolese, Belgian troops entered Elizabethville on July 10 to take control of the situation. Moise Chambe declared Katanga's independence on July 11, with Belgian support, which many saw as a puppet move for Belgian interests. On July 12, the President and Prime Minister of the Congo South UN Assistance, UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld, or gently addressed the Security Council, which resulted in the adoption of Resolution 143 on July 13. The resolution urged Belgium to withdraw its troops and authorized the Secretary General to assist in the withdrawal, the maintenance of law and order, and the legitimacy of the post-colonial government. However, the Congolese leaders were unaware that it was the beginning of a larger systemic exploitation by the UN itself. The mission was approved by the Security Council with eight votes in favor, none opposed, and three abstentions. ONUC's mandate was expanded to include preserving the Congo's territorial integrity by removing foreign mercenaries supporting Katanga's secession, a role never before played by a UN peacekeeping force. Later, the UN came under fire for its role in the Congolese crisis, particularly for how it handled situations like Lumumba's death and Katanga's secession. It was not carrying out its responsibilities, and reports of its involvement in gold smuggling were piling up. Following Lumumba's death, the UN faced widespread criticism, with many claiming that he should have received better protection. African American protesters breached the United Nations building in New York, disrupting the General Assembly. The UN office in Belgium was also targeted. The USR was also critical of the UN's role. On December 23, 1960, Khrushchev addressed the United Nations General Assembly, highlighting the operation's contentious political direction, accusations of responsibility for Lumumba's death, favoritism toward Lumumba's political opponents, 
and initial reluctance to address the situation in Katanga. According to Nori McQueen, the Soviets were confused about the UN's approach to peacekeeping in the Congo. Khrushchev went on to criticize the role of the UN's Secretary General, claiming that it concentrated too much power in one person. He proposed a radical reform, abolishing the position of Secretary General and replacing it with a Troika system. This proposal, however, was ultimately rejected. This program was later halted until another was launched. The UN Security Council established the United Nations Organization Stabilization Mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or NONUSCO, in resolutions 1279 and 1291 to monitor the peace process of the Second Congo War. It later turned its attention to the Itari conflict, the Kivu conflict, and the Dongo conflict. Previously known as the United Nations Mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or MONUSCO, until 2010, MONUSCO has received military and police personnel contributions from a variety of countries. Prior to the passage of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1291, the UN presence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo consisted of military observers tasked with observing and reporting on factions' compliance with peace accords. From 1999 to 2010, approximately $874 billion was spent on funding the monarch peacekeeping effort, but no one knew how much profit the UN was making from illegally stealing and smuggling gold. No evidence was allowed to surface, and reports from credible sources, such as the BBC and Human Rights Watch, were dismissed. The total strength of UN peacekeeping troops in the DRC was around 18,300 as of October 2017, with more than 30 nations contributing military and police personnel, with India being the largest contributor. The Lusidus is the source of the second UN military presence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. On July 17, 1999, the SACA signed a ceasefire agreement, and on August 6, 1999, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 1258, authorizing the deployment of up to 90 officers. The UN, you see, increased the number of officers from 90 to 18 through 300. What was the purpose of this? Why were 18 through 300 officers sent if 90 officers could handle the situation? More importantly, why did these thousands of troops fail to stop the violence? You can probably guess the answer. The UN Security Council authorized the deployment of a maximum of 5537 military personnel, including 500 military observers, in the DRC on February 24, 2000, with Resolution 1291. On April 4, 2000, Senegal's Major General Montaga Diallo was appointed commander of Monasco's military force. The mandate included monitoring the ceasefire agreement, developing an action plan for its implementation, collaborating with parties to release prisoners of war, facilitating humanitarian aid, and protecting UN personnel and civilians who were under imminent physical threat. However, none of these goals were met. Monik was authorized to take the necessary actions to protect UN personnel and facilities under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. Monik officials remained silent on major issues concerning mining in Congo, which occurred alongside bloodletting, arms trading, and extortion. Anvil mining, for example, has been linked to massacres in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Former U.S. Ambassador Kenneth Brown, who served at U.S. embassies in Brussels, Kinshasa, Congo Bratsville, and South Africa is one of Anvil's directors. Brown served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Africa and Director of Central African Affairs under George Estraltz and George H. Obush. Interestingly, Brown took over as Ambassador to the Republic of Congo for William Lacey Swing, the head of Monarch in the DRC. Meanwhile, Anvil Mining in Katanga has employed the former top internal intelligence and security chief of the United Nations Observer Mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo since 2006. People have now witnessed obvious events that prove the earlier reports. There are conflicting reports about a UN drone that allegedly crashed in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, with claims that it was carrying gold, guns, and diamonds. According to some sources, the drone was transporting gold and guns, while others claim it was on a humanitarian aid mission.
The UN has yet to issue an official statement on the incident, but everyone is aware of the facts. The drone is thought to have been operated by the UN peacekeeping mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, known as MONUSCO, which has been present in the country since 1999, assisting in the country's stabilization following years of civil war. The crash occurred in the eastern province of North Kivu, which is known for the presence of various armed groups. The cause of the crash has yet to be determined. The alleged presence of gold and guns on the drone has raised questions about the UN's role in the DRC, with some accusing the organization of participating in the country's mineral trade, which is frequently associated with violence and corruption. The UN has categorically denied these allegations, stating that its mission in the DRC is solely focused on peacekeeping and humanitarian assistance. The drone crash is anticipated to complicate the UN's efforts in the DRC, potentially leading to questions about the organization's use of drones in its peacekeeping operations. Those present near the drone claimed it was carrying over 900 pounds of pure gold, as well as diamonds, guns, and parachutes. In response, Democratic Republic of the Congo President Felix Sisakati declared that he has directed his government to hasten the withdrawal of the United Nations peacekeeping mission, MONUSCO, ensuring that it begins by the end of this year. MONUSCO, which took over a previous UN operation in 2010, sought to address insecurity in the DRC's east, where armed groups compete for control of territory and resources. However, the mission has come under increasing fire in recent years, with critics claiming that it failed to protect civilians from violence, resulting in deadly protests. Not only that, but incidents involving human drones carrying gold are exacerbating the situation. Sisakati expressed dissatisfaction with the peacekeeping missions deployed over the last 25 years during his address to the UN General Assembly, citing their inefficiency in dealing with rebellions and armed conflicts. As a result, he directed the government to begin talks with U.S. authorities about an expedited withdrawal of MONESCO, moving the start of the FASID withdrawal from December 2024 to December 2023. This decision comes after a crackdown on anti-UN demonstrations in Goma, Eastern Congo, last month, which resulted in at least 56 deaths and numerous injuries. Another protest in July 2022 killed over 15 people, including three peacekeepers in Goma and Butembo. Amnesty International's Jean Nambar Senga noted that citizens expected the UN to protect them when their government couldn't. However, the UN's inability to prevent or delay Sisakati's announcement coincides with the recent extension of the mandate of a regional military force deployed by the East African community's seven member states to suppress violence in eastern DRC. President Tshisekedi wants the world's second largest UN peacekeeping force to leave the country as soon as possible, citing its failure to address conflicts in the eastern region. In his UN speech, he chastised the 17,000-strong peacekeeping mission for failing to confront the ongoing fighting in eastern Congo, urging the country to seize control of its destiny. To reduce tensions in the region, he proposed accelerating the start of the peacekeeping mission's accelerated retreat. What are your thoughts? Should other African countries reject UN peacekeeping missions as well? Isn't it true that the West is using the UN as a tool to steal African resources and transport them to Europe? Let us know if you think Congo did the right thing by expelling the UN troops, or if it should do more to punish them. Would you like to see more videos like this one? If you answered yes, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon next to it. We've decided to bring videos about something that no one talks about, black culture, civilization, history, and evidence of how glorious blacks have been. Thank you for watching, and stay tuned for the next video.